So I'm going to talk about Microsoft Fabric and Data Mesh. Uh, data Mesh seems to be cropping up quite a bit during the conference. I've been to a couple of sessions that were specifically talking about Data Mesh, but also a few sessions where it seeming seemingly popped up. Uh, I'm sure you've you've heard it, people talking about it as well this during the week. Uh, so hopefully I give a slightly different perspective today that you can use to sort of build your, your thinking around Data Mesh and how you could apply that on Fabric. So my name's Barry Smart. I graduated as a phys physicist about 30 years ago, but I went into a role as a software engineer in the water industry initially, where I was a graduate software engineer. I was lucky enough to spend four years uh, actually working in Australia for Sydney Water. Then I came back to Scotland, uh, uh, where I took a role, a kind of well, my formative years were uh, as chief architect uh, in Scottish Power's energy trading business. Then I moved into the financial services sector, where I was promoted to CTO of a, um, uh, the UK's largest independent firm of consulting actuaries. And I, I led their adoption of public cloud. In fact, we were the first financial services organization in the UK to put personal data onto Azure. And during that time, I sort of redisc re rediscovered my love for uh, coding and software engineering and data, and I decided to take a career break. I went back to my alma mater, Strathclyde University, and I completed uh, a master's in artificial intelligence. And now I'm director of data and AI at Engine. Engine is a small uh, technology consultancy. We're a, fu a fully remote company based in the UK, but with customers all around the world. And we're small, but we're able to achieve big things, and that's because we leverage our expertise, our processes, and our intellectual property, and we like to help our clients do exactly the same thing. We're in an exciting time. We are kind of leaving the industrial age, and we're entering into a new digital age. Uh, industrial age was personified by physical power, which unlocked and transformed the way that we work and live. And it's the new power that's going to be transforming the way that we work and live is thinking power. Uh, and it's daunting for us, uh, but it's even more daunting for the organizations that we work in and the people that who could be impacted by uh, all of this. And it's our role as data professionals to sort of think about this and help organizations navigate that, that new world successfully. So Microsoft Fabric has come along. Um, I'm sure you've all heard about it, but this is the kind of slide that I used to explain it. It's really been interesting over the last 10 years to see the evolution of data platforms from on-prem to infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, serverless, and now software as a service. And Fabric is very much leading that sassification of the data landscape. And more recently, we've seen the emergence of intelligent agents, things like GitHub Copilot, that work alongside us as professionals and power us up. They, they help us to achieve more um, and act as that friend, friendly body that can, um, I guess, amplify our role as data professionals. And these two things together are having a significant impact on our ability to deliver value at scale into organizations. It also means through the sassification of data platforms that the barrier to entry is lowering. So small and medium organizations that might not be able to have justify an investment in a data platform and the team to run a data platform can now embrace platforms like Fabric with a very low cost of entry. Data Mesh. Uh, was conceived in 2018 by Zanak Degani. At the time, she was working in ThoughtWorks, who are a global, globally recognized thought leader at the time in areas such as agile software development and user-centric design. Um, and Zanak very much seemed to sort of lift thinking from the mainstream software engineering world into the data plane. She could see problems in the organizations that she was working with where centralized data platforms and data teams were becoming bottlenecks. And the vision that she, she established through Data Mesh was very much about decentralizing and democratizing data ownership across the, the organization. The way I like to personify Data Mesh, it's very much like bringing a kind of microservices ar architecture into the data, data plane itself. Data Mesh is founded on four principles. The one I really like is data as a product. I think it's a really useful way to think about how we deliver value into our organizations. A data product is a small unit of value that's meeting a specific need within the business. 
It's got users, like any product, that love the data product. They put it into use to achieve some end goal and some purpose. And if your data products are achieving that, then you're succeeding. Once you've got data products that are small and recognized in this way, you can then start to distribute ownership of those data products from a centralized model, and you can distribute ownership across the business, uh, placing ownership of those data products with the domains or the departments that are best placed to own, evolve, and deliver those uh, data products across the business. And there's this nice concept of interoperability interoper between data products, a bit like microservices, where you can plug them together. So you might have some data products that are close to the data uh, and deliver value by uh, presenting data in some way, but then you can build more sophisticated products, use those as foundations to build more sophisticated products on top. So this notion of, this is where the notion of the mesh comes from, it's that interoperability between the products. And all of this is enabled, first of all, by a self-serve data platform. So this is where we immediately start to think about fabric. Um, and also the concept of federated computational governance. So obviously, traditionally, uh, centralization of data and, and data expertise has made governance easy. As soon as you distribute ownership of data products across your organization, there's a risk there that things get out of control. So Zamek's solution to that is the concept of federated computational governance. It's using computational means of embedding uh, the governance into the platform so that you don't have to manage it through humans alone. It's also about putting more responsibility onto the domains who own the data products. After all, with power comes great responsibility. So it's about them stepping up and taking on responsibility of some of these uh, things that may have before being uh, centralized within the organization. The thing I like about Data Mesh is that it's very much about recognizing that data is a socio-technical endeavor. To succeed, uh, you know, don't just have to overcome the technical challenges, you're gonna have to overcome cultural and, and organizational challenges. And I think, to me, it's even more about that social piece than the technical piece. Um, and certainly what we see, if you can crack that organizational and cultural uh, concerns within an organization, you've got a much higher chance of succeeding. And this simple model kind of um, uh, brings us to life. You've got the data team on the left who deliver the data product, which meets the needs of the users on the right. So value is flowing from left to right. And as importantly, you have feedback loops. Um, hopefully you can see that down the bottom there, but that's really important. And where the flow of value or the feedback loops breaks down, you start to have problems. Um, and there's, thing, there's a thing called Cons Conway's Law that can often get in the way of these, uh, the flow of value and, and feedback loops. If you've got a disjointed, uh, disconnected organizational structure where things, the flow of value is spanning multiple teams and they work in a, in a sort of dysfunctional way, then the flow of value will be impacted accordingly and the ability for you to deliver value will be undermined. So the focus here is all about rapid and safe delivery of value and promoting these feedback loops, listening to what your feedback loops are telling you and being able to react to that, and this virtuous cycle uh, continues. Another great thing about uh, data, the data product principle is that I love is that bringing this product mindset along, um, and it helps, I think here, the challenge is to data teams to start acting as innovation centers within the organization. So traditionally, some of the data teams can turn into sort of uh, order takers where they sit back waiting for new, new requests to come into them. And this is about them actually partnering with the business and helping them to identify new ideas and, and ways in which data be can, can be leveraged to generate value within the organization. And high performance data teams really play to this life cycle. And they're prepared in the early stages of exploring or validating an idea to pivot or fail fast because they recognize not every idea uh, is is going to be worthy of taking into production. They're, they're aware of that sort of value uh, curve, but also the total cost of ownership that goes with any data product. And they're very conscious about delivering value at a, at a TCO that, um, that um, can be covered by the value that they're delivering. So a, a kind of useful way of thinking about um, data as a product is to look at your own existing estate, think about how you could identify data products in your current estate, and weed out those products that might, might not be delivering value today. By getting rid of those products, retiring them, you're creating space 
to go through this innovation cycle and find new sources of value you can deliver into your organization. Another interesting way to think about data mesh is to, if you remove the um, self-service data platform from the, the equation, you're left with the, the, these three principles that I talked about earlier. And there's natural tension between them. Um, if you think about domain-oriented ownership, that you know, as we discussed, to be able to do that in an environment where you're highly uh, governed can be difficult because it, it plays against your, your kind of constraints of governance. If you're in, in an organization that isn't ready to treat data as a product in terms of making, uh, providing a platform that can make data products discoverable and interoperable, domain-orientated ownership can really put stress on that as well because you're going to end up with data existing in silos and, and being locked away from being put into use. So these three dimensions aren't uh, you know, uh, orthogonal. They're, they're all sort of constrained. And what we find is that it's quite useful when we, when we talk to clients to try and identify the dimension here that they're most constrained with today and to focus on unlocking that. Because by unlocking that, like an elastic band being released, you can then push forward in the other uh, dimensions as well. So it's an interesting way of thinking about where are we today, where do we want to get to, and how can, we, how can we get there? What's the best strategy to get there? So that's data mesh. How does Fabric measure up to data mesh? This is a very high level uh, view of that. Um, so each of the, the principles uh, that underpin Fabric are bars on this chart. And you can see how Fabric today uh, meets those requirements. Um, what's interesting about this chart is it, it, it's not saying that Fabric should solely be responsible, for example, for delivering domain-orientated ownership. There's organizational readiness that's a major factor in that area as well. But that sort of dark blue area represents the gap as we perceive it today. So obviously, Fabric's pretty strong on the self-service data platform. Um, the biggest gap is around federated computational governance. Um, how do you address that? Well, as data professionals, as fabricators, if you like, uh, we have an opportunity and I guess a responsibility if our organization wants to embrace a data mesh inspired vision to plug that gap. And we believe strongly in data, data ops as being a great approach for, for plugging some of these gaps. Um, to us, data ops is basically just DevOps but applied to data pro projects. And this landscape is evolving. Um, really due to the forces I talked about before, the sassification of data platforms and that role that AI is starting to play in our day-to-day -day activities as uh, software developers and data professionals. And some of these activities will very much remain, though, uh, a human endeavor. But through data ops, um, you know, a, a lot of the activities in here around observability, discoverability, quality, and the like are all very much play to that gap currently uh, within Fabric. But the good news is you can bring other services in Azure to bear to, to plug these gaps. So it presents a bit of work that we need to do, but that's also an opportunity for us to help our organization differentiate pot potentially in this, um, in, in this environment. So if you like, you want to go for a data mesh inspired uh, vision uh, and you like the look of fabric, how do you plot a strategy? How do you find a way forward? There's a lot of things to consider, a lot of information uh, that's, that's out there to help to, that you're being presented with. And I love this quote from David McCandless, when you're lost in information, an information map is useful. And in this case, we like to use uh, a, a tool called a Wardley map. It's a two-dimensional map, but it, 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 it's specifically designed to give you situational awareness and help you to understand where you are today and the strategies that you could adopt in the future through movement uh, on, on the map. So the, the, the Wardley map is anchored at the top with the business goal or the end user need that you're seeking to achieve. And the vertical axis maps out your value chain. So you can see an example here with the activities that are most visible to the user at the top and those that are least less visible down towards the bottom. The really interesting axis is the horizontal axis. It plots the evolution, the natural evolution of technologies uh, and activities over time. 
And it's that evolution that uh, you can explore through the maps and how that can unlock new opportunities within your organization. So here's an example map that we put together when Fabric was released. We were keen to sort of explore how moving from an Azure platform to a Fabric platform could unlock value generically within any organization. Um, and you know, this is very generic, but you know, I would encourage you to sort of, if you want to explore Wardly Maps, use this as a template and um, start at the top. That's the primary uh, advice I would give you. Don't start with the technology. You know, it's not about a solution looking for a problem to solve. It's the other way around. Understand the business, the goals it's trying to achieve, map that value chain out, and then in the lower regions, understand how uh, Fabric could help you to um, deliver that, that, that goal or that objective in, in some way. So in conclusion, um, there's great promise. Um, Fabric is well aligned to the a data mesh vision. And there are many technical barriers there that aren't, that aren't you know, Fabric isn't an off-the-shelf solution. There are technology barriers there. But uh, we see the biggest barriers to success actually being more on the social side of the socio-technical uh, system that we're trying to deliver. For example, that the idea of domain ownership of data products is great, but is, are your users able and willing? Have they got the skills and have they got the willingness to build and own data products through their full life cycle? The SASification of these pr uh, um, platforms can present quite a, a bit of a threat to traditional IT and, and technology teams. Are they willing to embrace this new world and adapt their skills and responsibilities accordingly? And also, is the wider organization ready to adopt data and leverage the value of data? Is it willing to be agile and transform itself to uh, embrace this, this brave new world? And that view is very much backed up by this quote. Um, Professor Dame Coyle from the University of Cambridge isn't a technologist. She's a, a kind of public policy analyst. And she recognizes the current barriers to productivity, certainly in the UK, aren't technology problems. They're uh, the, the ability for organizations to understand how to leverage technology and put it into use. So my recommendations are don't start with the technology. Focus on the business goals. Think about that flow of value and those feedback loops in your organization today. Um, what are they telling you? And how could a data mesh or a fabric uh, vision perhaps help you to unblock the, the, the barriers that you're seeing? Use the Wardley maps to envisage that future and then explore it incrementally. I think the, the product mindset's a great, a great mindset to adopt. Uh, be more innovative, drive innovation within your organization. Be prepared to pivot or fail fast. Don't uh, fall into committing to uh, ideas that aren't going to deliver sufficient value to cover their total cost of ownership. And recognize that in all of this, that data is a social technical endeavor. People will be impacted if it's scary to us this, this world that we're coming into and the scale of change we're seeing is going to be 10 times scarier for those that aren't data professionals. And it's our role to help them understand and adapt and embrace this new world uh, in a responsible and ethical manner. So um, I've covered a huge amount of ground there. Um, if you want to explore any of the topics I've covered, um, there's a range of blogs on our website uh, that I and some of my colleagues have authored on, on these topics. So please, if you, if you want to explore any of this in, in more depth, please uh, visit the Engine blog. And the only thing I would ask that you do, uh, thanks for coming along to the session, but it'd be really great to get your feedback, um, not least because every piece of feedback generates a contribution to a charity of your choice. So there's one reason to do it. The other reason is um, your name will get entered in the prize draw this afternoon. And finally, I'd just love to hear uh, what you thought of the session. Thanks very much for your attention. And um, I don't think we've got time for questions, but please come and find me at the end if you've got any questions. Thank you.